and efficiency. These are the transportation achievements of modern science. The world's finest pursuit planes, capable of power dives faster than the speed of sound. Torpedo boats skimming the waters at a mile a minute clip. Monster tanks with a top speed better than 60 miles per hour. And not only in time of war, but in our daily lives as well. Farm tractors with high compression engines. Quick, efficient transportation. Comfort and perfect safety. Yes, man is conquering time and distance. But has science done its utmost? Has science reached the limits of achievement in transportation? To find the answer, let's look into the past, back to the beginning of this long road of progress. Back to the first of five great discoveries, the first milestone, the greatest single invention of all time, the wheel. Power was provided by animals or by man himself. The fuel was food. But more power was needed and men searched for some means of creating power. Could the power of fire be harnessed to the wheel? Man tried for centuries. And in 1769, James Watt, bringing vast improvements to the earlier efforts of many others, developed the steam engine. His ideas were quickly applied in steam-driven carriages. Wood was the fuel, creating power to turn the wheel mechanically. And thus, the second great milestone was reached. But not, however, without some protest from the law. England, and the time is 1865. A noisy and dangerous vehicle, dropping red-hot coals on the highways, and driving horsemen and frightened teams into the field. Therefore, it is decreed by this act that no power vehicle can use a highway anywhere in Great Britain unless it is preceded by a man on foot carrying a red flag. Good! Tell them! I'm for it! But progress still continued. As Watt's engine was improved, man could use better fuels, coal, and in some cases, natural gas. Yet even with these fuels, engines did not have enough power. They were heavy, cumbersome, and the development of better engines was handicapped for the want of still better fuels. Then, out of the hills of Pennsylvania, oil. Drake's first well was regarded as a crackpot venture. The nation laughed at a man's folly. But almost overnight, the first great oil boom was on. Derrick sprang up like mushrooms. Men swarmed into Pennsylvania, and the oil was used for lighting and lubrication. With a troublesome byproduct, gasoline. Millions of barrels of it were poured into the rivers and streams of Pennsylvania. Until the gasoline engine was invented, the third great milestone on the road of progress. In 1892, the first gasoline-driven car ran on the roads in America. And so quickly did American genius develop this new invention that by 1900, the first automobile show was held at Madison Square Garden in New York City. They really have perfected the thing. I don't see how anybody could improve on that automobile. Oh, no. There's no belt on this car. Uh, the car is modern chain drive. That means no lost power. Uh, you can easily make 20 miles an hour with this powerful machine. Uh, let me show you how it operates. But only a man could drive it. Only a man with the strength of Ajax, the cunning of Ulysses, and the speed of Hermes could crank and start these balky contraptions. Something had to be done about this. And so, in 1912, it was done. The first electric self-starter deserves to be ranked as the fourth milestone. Another basic contribution to your modern automobile, because it did more than start motors conveniently and safely. It started factories and employment, and the demand for automobiles doubled within two years. 
the motor age was here. And from a seat behind the driver of this splendid achievement, let's review the long road over which we have rolled. We've come a long way, haven't we? From the hand-hewn cartwheel, the use of fire as a source of power, and on through to the slow development of the internal combustion engine and its starter. We're going places now, stepping on it, and why not? Ahead is the open road, open to progress, cleared of all obstacles to better cars with more power and more speed. Progress is in high, hitting on all four cylinders. Uh-oh, what's that? Something holding back progress? Slowing us up? Listen to that sharp metallic sound from the engine. That means loss of power, overheating, and even damaged pistons and bearings. And here we believe the internal combustion engine to be a success. But listen to it. To get more power and speed out of that kind of engine, we'd have to increase its size and weight, increasing as well its consumption of fuel. And every inch and pound added to an engine was an acknowledgement of engineering defeat, a surrender to that metallic pinging sound that so few men heard as the knocking of opportunity. Many engineers believe progress in automotive design faced a stone wall. What caused the knock, they asked. The industry buzzed with arguments, differences of opinion, theories, and conflicting claims. It's the carburetor. Carbon causes it. It's the exhaust manifold. It's the timing. It's the bearings. It's the cylinder head. It's the distributor. Timing. Risk pin. Carbon. But meanwhile, three men of science strike out on a new trail. Charles F. Kettering, Thomas Midgley, Jr., and T.A. Boyd. Theirs was an entirely new and unexplored field of investigation. They determined to prove their firm convictions that it was the fuel and not the engine that knocks. To their laboratory, then, went an order. They demanded to see the fuel actually at work, to look inside an engine when the knock occurred. We want a hole bored right through the wall of the combustion chamber, about a two-inch hole. Looking through a quartz window into the combustion chamber, these scientists found that the flame caused by the explosion of gasoline was blue during normal combustion, but white hot when knocking occurred. Temperature readings also indicated increased heat during knocking. So they devised a new instrument, the pressure time indicator which registered the pressure inside the cylinder. During normal combustion, this instrument showed regular even explosions. But when knocking occurred, there were irregular, jagged peaks, indicating a series of high pressures dropping off sharply to low pressures within the cylinder. And these irregular peaks at the point of combustion were heard as a knock. Now they knew what happened inside the cylinder. Gasoline vapor, ignited by the spark, burned across the combustion chamber, compressing the remainder of the gasoline vapor into a smaller and smaller space until the pressure became so high that the remaining vapor ignited with great heat and a terrific explosion. So loud, it sounded like metal striking metal. Since knock was always accompanied by high temperatures, they decided to put some ingredient in the gasoline to give it a dark color, because dark colors absorb heat. This might prevent the knock. They tried iodine, which was dark in color and soluble in gasoline, and an amazing thing happened. The knock was gone. The temperature was lowered. These scientists had proved their theory. It was the fuel which knocked and not the engine. But the use of iodine was not practical. It was expensive and bad for the engine. 
And when other dark colored compounds failed to eliminate knocking, they knew that it was not iodine's color which had stopped the knock, but its peculiar chemical effect. Therefore, other chemicals, some other one chemical, might do the job. But could they find this secret among all the elements and compounds of the earth, the sea, the air, the entire universe? Visualize the tremendous task before these pioneers. The Russian scientist, Dmitry Mendeleev, many years before, provided a key to the answer, the periodic table of the elements. In this table, all the known elements of the universe were grouped according to their atomic weights and chemical characteristics. A definite path of exploration was first mapped out among those elements chemically similar to iodine. But even with this aid, the search went on for weeks, months, years. Many thousands of chemicals and combinations of chemicals were tried and studied, and still they did not have the answer. Trial and error, experimentation, failure time and again. They had almost exhausted this line of research. Only a few chemical elements remained when they decided to try one more test. And it may prove that the search for a practical anti-knock chemical is a hopeless task. The graph from the pressure time indicator showed a series of smooth and regular power impulses. The knowledge of this compound led them to the best answer to the long search, the most effective anti-knock compound, tetraethyl lead, the basic ingredient of today's ethyl fluid. Now let's see the effect of this new discovery on engine combustion. Slow motion pictures of an engine taken through a quartz window show the effect of ethyl fluid on the combustion of gasoline. First, we see ordinary gasoline in the engine. It ignites and burns across the combustion chamber, compressing the unburned portion of the vapor until it explodes. This second explosion starts at the far side of the chamber, burning inwardly, so that when the two terrific forces meet, we get the sound of collision, which is not. Now ethyl fluid is added to the same gasoline. It burns evenly across the combustion chamber, increasing pressure and pressing the piston down with a smooth, powerful force. The destructive knock is gone. Let's watch two cylinders side by side. Ordinary gasoline is being used on the left. The same gasoline plus ethyl fluid in the cylinder on the right. Under laboratory conditions, it eliminated the knock. But would it mean increased performance on the road? Here's the answer, the first spectacular public test of the new discovery. Indianapolis, 1924. Seven of the 20 drivers have added ethyl fluid to their gasoline. These seven are the research workers in a mighty laboratory. Mile after mile around the brick oval, hour after grueling hour, subjecting fuel and engines to the severest possible ordeal. The checkered flag waves the winners over the line. First, second, and third cars to finish have added ethyl fluid to their gasoline. 
They won that race because they had increased power. And year after year, since that first important trial, the winners' cars have ridden to victory with ethyl fluid in their tanks. Thus, proof was established. And now, at last, the fifth milestone, a fuel which permitted a vast increase in engine efficiency. And as motoring requirements increased, great plants were set up to supply the huge quantities needed. To produce the needed ingredients in large volume, thousands of men were put to work, a new industry created. At Deepwater, New Jersey, and at Baton Rouge, Louisiana, vast manufacturing plants produced the completed ethyl fluid. Thus, science made possible the manufacture of ethyl fluid in sufficient quantities. And yet, constant research work still went on and continues in progress today. Unceasing studies devoted to new methods of manufacture and the development, testing, and improvement of compounds for combustion control. Ethyl laboratories working with the oil and automotive industries aided in the development of increasingly better fuels and better engines. And if you want to see dramatically what this has meant to you, here's an automobile engine of 1920. Its compression ratio was three and a half to one. It developed 100 horsepower, and it weighed 1,500 pounds. And here's an engine of today. Many changes and refinements have taken place, made possible by the improvements of fuel and design. The compression ratio has been doubled to give the same 100 horsepower as the old engine. But see how much smaller it is, with one-third the weight of the big brute of 1920, which incidentally ate up twice as much gasoline in developing its 100 horsepower. This added power and economy of modern motors opened the door to progress in all fields of transportation. On the water, in record-breaking speed marvels, in the air, where more power per pound of engine means higher speed in a wider flying range for regular air travel as well as for our bomber and fighting planes. To high compression and to Antonov fuel, we owe these modern miracles of science. And the search for more power and efficiency goes on. Today, it is directed toward the improvement of fuels for vehicles of war, faster airplanes, more powerful tanks, better trucks, scout cars, and other implements of our mechanized forces. These studies of fuels and engines, the problems related to higher speed and fighting power, command today the fullest and best efforts of the oil and automotive industries. And in this great work, ethyl continues to play its important part. The rewards of this research must now be devoted almost wholly to our fighting tools just as other manufacturers the country over are responding and must respond first to the call of our country. Thus, we must in wartime get along without many of the products and await the improvement of products which hitherto were so much a part of our daily lives. But the coming of a new day and a lasting peace will bring to us a vast store of achievements in transportation far beyond our present-day accomplishments. So, as we look back over the long road on which man has traveled, we see that progress has never stopped. As we look to the future, we know with confidence that progress never will stop. As long as science and industry continue to search unceasingly for better fuels and for better engines, victory, as well as progress in transportation, is certain to come.